Thanks for joining us. I'm Jay Michaels, and I'm here with Mary Elizabeth McCary. Hi. Five Star Arts Journals has been, uh, for more than 10 years now, reviewing and interviewing some of indie theater's most promising names. They range from young and emerging artists first finding their feet in NYC to Broadway producers who take advantage of the rich landscape of talent and visibility that is the theater festival. Now, the Passion Pit interviews are letting these artists speak their minds on life in the theater and maybe a project or two in the works. Look for interviews by authors Susan Merson, Gary Morgenstein, Patrick Hickey, singer educated Dave, educator, he's educated too, David Sabella, the editor in chief of Cabaret Hotspot, I might add, and film producer Connie Hoy, who will be speaking today. She is part of Johnny B. Dunn's upcoming film, Free Range. In future, we'll be talking to Broadway producer Jim Kirsted, as well as theater professionals Doug DeVita, Lori Ray Waugh, Joe Anise, Jake Lippman, Anthony J. Piccioni, Dorian Palumbo, Barnaby Edwards, musician Dan Furman, and author, entrepreneur Christopher M. Strzok, improver extraordinaire Nanette Deasy, filmmaker Mark Barron, and the legendary raconteur Richard Skipper, and a host of others. Now, an interesting thing's been happening out there in Theaterland. Uh, uh, we are entering another realm for women artists. They are finally starting to get the respect they deserve. It seems that uh, women are taking more control of companies and taking a greater position within companies. And we're thrilled that today we have three women that were interviewed. Brittany Church, one of the stars of this 21st century take on Hansel and Gretel, uh, Finding Them Lost in Macy's 2018. Uh, we also have Carrie Edel Isaacman and her production of As You Like It. It is part of her theater company that she started called Shakespeare Sports. And Connie Hoy, who just joined the ranks of producer uh, for the upcoming independent film with a screenplay by Johnny B. Dunn, Free Range. It's the story of a group of gay students of a local GSA who take on a major rodeo championship. So we're here to see how these uh, powerful women are holding on to the theater. Uh, and now let's hear from Brittany. This is Brittany. Brittany Church, this is Jay Michaels. Yeah. If I'm on the line, you're on the air. Okay, how, all right. Hello. How, how are you? I'm doing fine. I, uh, you know, I'm sure like many others, uh, <laughs> yesterday I enjoyed some delicious food and fun fellowship with friends. So today's a, a restful day for me. I hear you. Right before you, you, you begin again on Sunday with Hansel and Gretel, a Christmas Hansel and Gretel. Um. Tell us about the show. You're running now about three weeks, I think, and you still have like another yes, four yes. more. And you just, congratulations, you just added performances. That's right. That's right. We are now having, uh, when December starts, we're going to be having two shows each Sunday, one at 1 p.m. and one at 3 p.m. Oh, that's great. So it can kind of get around uh, some schedules with, I know, church and, and other things on Sundays to get in the way. <laughs> but now we have two times the chance to uh, to see us. Uh, yeah, so um, the show's been going really well. I uh, have worked with this company before. It's called Fact, uh, short for Friends Always Creating Theater. And, um, yeah, I've had a great time so far. <laughs> um, now, it's updated. This is not the gingerbread house and all of our other stuff that we all learned as children. What's, uh, what's the new Hansel and Gretel? So this new Hansel and Gretel, it takes place here in New York City. You'll hear a lot of familiar places being mentioned, like Macy's and Central Park. <laughs> That's one of the first big changes. The second uh, big change is that it is modern day. So it is in the here and now. And then the third big change is uh, there are, it's, you know, it's a little less scary for, for the younger kids. There is no witch, there is no oven, and there is no violence of any kind. So it's very family friendly. No violence. This is the 21st century. What do you mean, no violence? <laughs> not in our show. Now, now you guys are in street clothes. Also, you guys, you, you're not in like little Lieberhausen and things like uh, the original. You're you're more modernized, even in your look. That's right. That's right. Um, because it takes place in modern day. Uh, you know, we are are dressed as as people you'd see kind of out on the street. You can still recognize people as the characters they're supposed to be, but. Uh, 
yeah, it's a modern take. On it. Do you think the kids uh, attach to it better when they look when when they literally look and say, "Hey, that could be me up there." Do you think they learn a stronger I, lesson? I do. You know, I think it's important for uh, you know every piece of theater nowadays for all different types of people to come in and to be able to look at the actors on stage and relate to them. And and I think you know for kids it is really neat uh, for them to see people who who could be themselves. Um, I know that Jack, our director, had talked to a little girl after uh, one of our shows that we've already done, and and he uh, had asked, well, you know, did did it look like fun? Do you think maybe one day you'll be up there on stage? And she was like, yeah, you know, I think I could. So I think (laughs) even in that way, I think even in that way, you know, we're we're having the kids who come to see the show relate and maybe inspiring future uh, actors and actresses, which is always fun. That's very cool. Um, now you're also in, you're also in one of the tiniest theaters, the Manhattan Rep. Oh, yes. The, let's just, w- when I say intimate, I'm, I, that word's in italics and quotes. Um, d- how does it feel to you and how do you think it feels to the audience that, that you're right there, that they're, they're almost part of the action. They're almost standing so close. They're part of the action. Yes. I, I have always been a fan of, of those smaller, more intimate, uh, venues. I think it's, Especially with our show, it is, you know, it's only an hour long, and there's only, it's a small cast, I believe we're only seven people, and uh, I think it's less intimidating for little kids, um, first of all, that, you know, it's not such a big space, and, and you know, um, you can see really well, because, of course, you're you're very close. I think we've only got three or four rows of seats um, in this tiny place, and it just feels Oh, it feels cozy. You know, you come in off, it's finally getting cold in the city. You come hmm. in out of, out of the streets and you just come into this nice little, little space and you can sit and see a show for an hour. It's, it's, it's really nice. And for us, what's really fun is that we can feel a little better and see a little better the, the reactions that some of the lines get or, you know, how people are enjoying the show, which uh, so far everyone who's come has seemed to really like it. That's great. That's great. It's sort of like you're you're telling the story to them. It's almost like like truly, you know, uh, like 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 telling them a bedtime story because they're so close. You're they're, they're virtually sitting on your laps. Uh, totally. That's really great. That's really great. Okay, I have the big question for you, and it's so non children's theater. So here we go. Um, okay. Uh, we're in a world now. Uh, uh, let's let's just say uh, at last there is a far stronger feminine presence in the arts and everywhere when you really get down to it. You can you can find it in so many things now, uh, but in the arts especially. Um, how does it feel for you being a, a, a female artist I- in the 21st century? What's, what's, what's the good? What's the obstacles? What's going on on that level for you? Uh, well, that is a completely different question. <laughs> um, I personally have had a pretty great experience um, being female in in the arts uh, in the city. Um, Of course, I think in theater, there in the past has been a disproportionate uh, ratio of like male to female parts in a lot of shows. You look back at classic things, but um, coming from the point of view of an actress, I think that uh, people have noticed that. It has come to the attention. And I also think that female directors, female writers, Mm -hmm. um, you know, females on the creative side, even female casting agents uh, have been on the rise. And I think that they noticed that when they were in in possibly the acting side of the business or or coming up in the business and have said, this is, this needs to change. And and they are doing that. And um, I think we're on a, on a good trend. I, I think, you know, sometimes you get out of things, and, it, and it's still a frustrating, but I think we're definitely uh, on an upward trend. And and what's really neat is is when you do get to be in a cast with a lot of fellow women, and you've all been through kind of the same thing. It, it's it's a very competitive field, but sometimes I think when you find the right people in the right cast, they come together and 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 support each other. And I think especially with women, where there can be a tendency. Sometimes just because of the small amount of roles or positions available to us, there is a natural sense of competition. But um, I think the way that we're all looking and the way that, that 
you know, culture and um, America, I guess, are, <laughs> <laughs> uh, our, our, uh, you know, the way that viewpoints are changing. Um, I think it's become a uh, friendlier space. We all have realized that as women, we, we need to support each other instead of, of tearing each other down, which has been really neat. Good for you. Good for you. Well said. Well said. Brittany, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. I'll tell our readers, readers, <laughs> our listeners, uh, uh, exactly when and where they can go see A Hansel and Gretel Christmas by Jack DeVille in the middle of Manhattan about these two waifs traveling through the middle of Manhattan. Um, and I want to thank you so much for speaking with us, and I wish you all the best with the show and all the best in all your endeavors. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And My pleasure. Well. Great. I'll talk to you soon. Ciao. All right. Bye. That was a great interview. What, thank you very much, Brittany, for taking the time to speak to us. So that's about A Hansel and Gretel Christmas, which was by Jack DeVille, which finds the famed brother and sister lost during the holidays in New York City in 2018 and finds out what they think about Macy's. This is every Sunday in November 4th, the 11th, the 18th, and the 25th at 1 p.m. It's also Sundays in December on the 2nd, the 9th, the 16th at 1 p.m. and 3 at Manhattan Rep Theater, New York City, which is at 17 West 45th Street. You take the elevators up to the third floor. This special production is dedicated to co-founder and producer David Gillum Fuller. Tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com and on TDF off off at 9 Hope you come see it. It sounds like it's really a great, great project. It's hilarious. From what I hear, it's doing really well, and the kids are loving it, and the actors are loving it that the kids are loving it. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. It's good to have young children have a chance to see live theater. After all, if live, if little children and medium-sized children don't get <laughs> to see theater, then there is no theater in the future. Right. So having these special things done just for kids is very helpful. It teaches them about live, live actors, about storytelling, about behavior in the theater, how to get to a theater, where the theater might be in their neighborhood or in their city. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have for all kinds of kids. And perfect at the holiday season when children are supercharged and have a lot of energy, a lot of excess energy and excitement. Oh, for sure. To have something to do that takes up an hour or so of time and teaches them a moral lesson at the same time. So thank you, Jack DeVille, for creating that for these children. I think that's a wonderful thing. As a mother myself, I think it's wonderful that that kind of stuff is available for children in the city of New York. Jack's been in the business for six years so so he he knows how to please an audience that's great so what's next okay now we're going to hear from Carrie Edel Isaacman and her company Shakespeare Sports they're bringing a fascinating new production of as you like it to New York it's gonna run November 30 through December 8 uh, it's set in the Midwest in 1968 so why don't we hear Carrie tell us all about it you just beat me to it oh wow <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Carrie Isaacman. If I am on the line, then you are on the air. Wow. Welcome to my podcast. Welcome to the interview. Um, wow. Good to speak to you. I haven't spoken to you since we did that film forum 130 years ago. Yes. Uh, and I'm thrilled to hear that you are supplying me with a fix as I'm a Shakespeare junkie. And you have a new production of As You Like It going up next week in New York at the historical at this historic Players Theater down on yep. McDougal Street. Um, you, you do what I love. You, you've taken Shakespeare and you've, you've given it a modern parable. Tell us about your production. Okay. And um, by the way, I'm, I'm sitting here with my son who's asking for chicken, There's, uh, which, so just so you know what's going on in the background here. I'm um, going to turn the oven on. Um, the, the show that goes up. <laughs> well, that's good for our listeners to know. Chicken is right. on the menu tonight. Too, too much information. Um, but but I'm, I'm, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your podcast. And, um, I, and, and thank you for the questions. And I am, I'm also a Shakespeare junkie and I'm, I feel that my, the cast who are, um, that I'm, I'm, I could call myself co-directing because as a, as a director, um, it, it, I definitely collaborate. I have ideas, but then it's, I'm, how I'm going about directing is responding to what the actors are giving. 
And what makes this As You Like It unique as opposed to any other um, As You Like It that's been produced since, oh, four, 500 years ago, somewhere between <laughs> four, 450 years ago, is the original music. And um, somehow when I, when I started the, what, how I came up with the idea for this production was I thought it was going to be super ultra modern because I really liked that. Like, how do we relate to Shakespeare's words today? What does it mean today? And why after 450 years, what do I have to say today? So I always think ultra modern, but it just kind of light. I had a light bulb moment where I thought, wow, you know, they're in the forest and with all of the um, protesting that's going on, which reminds me of what I've seen in pictures about what protests were like in the late 60s and early 70s, I would really like to set this in the 60, late 60s. And so then I started talking with musicians and composers uh, and um, one person who was auditioning for, uh, for, for the role of Hyman brought her ukulele and then I when I was auditioning people on um, I was really more about roles I started asking people if they could sing and then I started thinking wow I really want to do more of the music in this production and so here we are with having um, original compositions for all of the music and as you like it which as far as I know isn't done a lot usually maybe one or two songs are used and not all of them um, I, I, as far as I know, I think there are some that are, then some productions that go and, and work on all the music, but that's been a, a great joy for me to get to work on. Um, and just being really, you know, conscientious about rights and stuff, I know it was really important to do that. So as we, as it turns out, the person who is playing Hyman, she wrote the composition for her music and another song. And then I spoke with Donna Stearns, who is a director. Um, I, she acts as well, and and a composer, and she composed the other music for the other songs. Oh, that's great! Um, and I really the the cast I I have to say is enjoyable, and I'm I'm indulging in playing the role of Audrey, which is tons of fun. I it's 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 a lot of it's a lot of fun that that role Audrey. So so you're uh, it's interesting that you've taken the the turbulent '60s uh, and yeah. made it a parable for today in terms of protest, in terms of political upheaval. You're also making a statement about music because the 1960s music went through a paradigm shift, uh, the likes we have yet to see again. Uh, so yep. you're sort of by 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 taking the, the the original score, for lack of a better term, from Shakespeare, and and musicalizing it, then then you're you're making several parables with this, several educational parables. That's great. Certainly, certainly, there were a lot of things that were going on that were changes hand in hand with political with ideas about. Um, changes that needed to be made and along with those expressions of change was music and um and many and many other things i suppose you could say well what other things were affected by by the political change you know and when you're when a person is as you're a professor so you would relate to this is <laughs> is if you're if you're teaching theater looking at society and what are the different changes when you're doing research that were going on at that time and how did one thing affect the other so yeah i, I suppose that the two work together definitely you're also using i remember you telling me you're using like uh, the method of scrolls or something like yes. that oh yes yes um actor cue scrolls a lot of fun it's um i i was introduced to that when I was doing when I was um, invited to be part of a company several years ago and I just thought um, what the the um, unrehearsed Shakespeare which many people when they work on them they go straight to the how how it's developed is that when you do unrehearsed Shakespeare there's supposed to be very little rehearsal only right. rehearsal on what Shakespeare's stage directions but I think I may have shared this with you when I when I wrote about how I came up with the idea of doing something that's more extended from under her Shakespeare is by the time you really work into the music and all of the things that Shakespeare's saying need to be there you kind of have a show so it, it may be that in the future I just want to use the scrolls as a rehearsal tool and I think there is debate about if the scrolls were on stage with the actor with Shakespeare's men throughout their rehearsal process and their shows or if they just use them for rehearsal time um, there was very little time during Shakespeare's day to go from rehearsal to um, to show so they they each had their part and this is kind of bringing that in it's it is teaching of history of what was it like to rehearse in Shakespeare's day and we're just using that on stage 
That's pretty cool. So, so essentially, aside from modernizing it, you're also bringing us yeah. back to the real way it was done way back when. <laughs> it, it's kind of ur- urban and way back when. Wow, that's great. So, so when we walk into your production, we're going to see exactly how Shakespeare and his guys put it together. And then yeah. you're going to show us what the 60s have to do with what's going on in the world today. So we get then, now, and even further then. Good for yep. you. Good for Thanks. you. I was going to also say draw a, a, a connection between the, the costumes and, um, and, and the Renaissance, which is that, um, thankfully, the, the person who was lending us the costumes said, you know, there really is something that she's lending us the costumes, which really, which are in Arden, which is the, the, when the teenagers, um, well, which we've now shifted them to early college kind of makes a little bit more sense in our modern day. Especially when they're playing the, them as when, hippies, then yes, definitely. When the lead characters go and are made to leave, and then those who are their allies are made to leave and go into the forest of Arden, um, they have to, they are faced with having to survive and they meet people they never would have met. And so they start, like, Rosalind has to dress up as a boy, and then who is accompanying her is her cousin. So, um, I, I I would like wish I had some good examples of what that was would have been like in real life, but Shakespeare uses that young girl dressing up as a young man so that she can survive and go has to go and survive like Viola and goes into the woods. But many the, all of the characters have the Renaissance costumes that our costumer has and is lending us. And she said, you know, in the '60s they really did kind of have a, a connection with Renaissance look. If you look on these album covers, for example. Of some of the music I looked at when I was re- researching music from the 60s and what I talked about with the composers, for example, you have people dressed up in Renaissance costumes <laughs> many times. So they kind, was, there was a there that, was a connection there. You're hey. right. There was there was a start of it. You look at a lot of uh, a lot of pictures from the the late 60s into the 70s. You see the ruffles and you see flares and you see things that you probably saw during the Renaissance as well. In yeah. Yeah, I think Renaissance Fair. I'm not sure when it was started, but I think it was kind of a kind of kind of a part part of that. I don't know. I, I think it may have been started in the '60s or something, maybe early '70s. It, it but, looks like it started in the '60s. Let's yeah, it, it does look like that. Okay, so now I have the big question, and this is the real curveball. Um, I have been noticing lately, and we're we're going to do this on the podcast. Also, we're going to have uh, uh, stories about this. There is an obvious shift. Also, in terms of personnel, I'm seeing so many more women taking command of their art, of the shows, of companies, or whatever. And you're a perfect example. You're the artistic director of Shakespeare Sports. Um, uh, Tell me what it's – I'm seeing it from my end, but tell me what it's like to be a a female artist in the 21st century. What's the good? What's the the, the obstacles? What's – how do you feel about being a – a female artist in the in this century. Uh, well, I, I I I that let's see how do I approach that? Um, well, the 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 hmm, um, the the where do I start with that? More <laughs> like uh, um, the po- the thing that that is an, a reason why I would want. Oops, just a moment. Just Nathan, one second. Um. This, one of the reasons that I would want to uh, be a female artist who is kind of at the helm of of leading a group for a, a of something like the art form of theater is that um, it's a way for me it's, to be frank. It's a way for me to get to do the art itself. Mm-hmm. Bottom line. I mean, I, I wish I could say. Uh, I, I, as it turns out, thankfully, let me say this, and let me let me frame it this way. As it turns out, I actually enjoy it, and I started to look at what my strengths were. And so, as an individual, and maybe why am I also, in addition to that, directing? Because the last time that we worked together, I was really kind of more focused on on acting. And um, so, why the shift to directing? Also, as you know, speaking from the individual. My 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 own perspective of why the shift in or maybe this is in addition to your question. Mm-hmm. I started looking at my strengths from when I studied theater arts way back in San Francisco, and I I got a pretty good. I had a, a very easily directing in the classwork that I did was was a little bit 
easier for me than I had anticipated when I thought that acting was kind of the first thing that I would want to be doing since that was that was the focus. Um, so I'm I'm directing, and and uh, it and and as it turns out, I'm 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 enjoying it, and I am getting to combine through this art form the the old and the new. So. Anyway, I, I think that the challenge might be, and this is a challenge for oh, everyone, is how to how to raise money. And so I, in addition to that, needed to work on, um, you know, sustaining my, my daily life, which is outside of theater. Um, I work with kids, um, and then on, t- and then from that, I can start um, a um, the foundations for for producing. And because of the good experience, I although we're we're going to be opening very soon, I would want to do it again. So. So you think now in the 21st century, you have more. Uh, would you say you have more opportunity as as uh, a woman artist? Or? Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, in the in the twenty first century, well, um, I'd say that these days that there is a lot more. Like, I want to do that when the barriers that I've faced, you know, may have been that if someone just wanted to do something, they maybe they couldn't. So there there are more opportunities, I suppose. Um, and more I welcoming wish, for women these days. Yeah, yeah, and more like, hey, that's great that you want to. I, I'd say more to a greater extent these days. Yes. Good, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad uh, those doors are opening for you as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess it means that. It, it, I guess part of it is that I'm, I'm enjoying it. I guess that's kind of the whole. That I, I would think that it's just like, well, if a person likes it, they can do it. But in the past that any person if it's just like are the doors open for them so I, anyway. so you found you found there may have been some barriers for you you know way back when or or even for our predecessors if you will for your predecessors but now for you to use your art for you to say i'm going to do this it's a little more open for you yeah at this day and time yes cool well may it keep opening and and may you produce all of his canon and and have a blast doing it constantly i definitely i that's what i definitely plan to do there are some plays that would be more difficult for me like s- some of the histories because you know how some people are real history buffs mm-hmm. and i just haven't had a lot of time with that i really like the idea of working on henry six part one if i had to or henry four part one but there are some directors out there who just know the histories really well i know the comedies really well just because as an actor i always was that was easier for me and and some of the um the romances i really like a lot and some of the tragedies i really like a lot i think for my next steps i would want to work on plays that i've done as an actor so that i can easily navigate them and maybe i would bring someone to collaborate with me on history play and when you do richard the third call me that's a dream role oh cool okay um, carrie thank i want to thank you that. so much oh my pleasure um, i want to thank you so much for for speaking with me today i will tell our listeners exactly when and where and how they can get tickets and where the show is and how great a time they're going to have should i the say production. that now or you're going to say don't it? even worry i'm gonna i'm gonna okay. say it i'm gonna say it later because i know your son is bugging you to prepare <laughs> lunch <laughs> so i'm gonna let you go do that and and I'll take it from here. Thank you so much for speaking with me, and good luck with the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for including me in your podcast. Talk to you a little later then. You bet. Ciao. Great. Bye. Great. Thank you, Carrie. This is As You Like It, and it's going to be playing in the city of New York from December 30th to December 8th um, at downtown's Historic Players November Theater. 30th. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm rushing things along. Sorry. November 30th. <laughs> I keep thinking it's later in the year than it is. November 30th through December 8th, beginning of December, at Downtown's Historic Players Theater. This is a 115 McDougal Street between West 3rd and Bleecker Streets. It's a great theater. It's It's a great great stage. We've done shows there. We did actually a Fringe Festival show there some years back. I think maybe two. We did two shows there at the Players Theater. Yes, we did. And it's a nice place. And nice people run it. And it's a great, comfortable place to go see a show. And it's kind of a good idea to do something that's not holiday specific Mm. during this time of the year because it gets to be a little... Uh, too sweet after a while and one needs to cleanse the palate and Shakespeare and As You Like It is a perfect way to do that and it's a great company and great show Shakespeare's comedies are quite intellectual and a lot of fun and rarely done everybody aims for the tragedies they all go see that Scottish play or Hamlet or Richard the Third so 
to go see one of uh, his more lighthearted pieces is is still apropos well, for Jay the and I have done about, I don't know, maybe 20 different Shakespeare productions or maybe more. And we know that it's specifically very hard to do the comedies. Comedies oh, yeah. are actually harder than the tragedies in Shakespeare, at least that we've come to know, because... Uh, uh, they're done in it. They were done in a different style at the time. It's a very uh, sort of slapstick in vaudeville sort of a style, and people at this time don't really understand that kind of comedy. So it's hard to get it done. And this company I hear is doing a fantastic job doing a comedy of uh, Shakespeare's. They're they're uh, as as Carrie mentioned, they're doing it in in old style as they did in the days of Shakespeare, but they're updating it to the present, well, so it smart. becomes very no, I accessible. Think it's smart. They're doing it in 1968, which is great. Yeah. You know, you were saying, well, there's a homeless Orlando and Rosalind mm -hmm. meet up in the woods, set of necessity, and, that, and hippies and that kind of the thing. The merry band of players becomes hippies, that's yes. funny interesting. We just did a, a production of Lion, which we set in 1968, too. So now that 1968 has become old time. Was it 68? Yeah, 1968. Oh, that's, that's exactly great. wrote that. We, gave, put, we put Lion back where it was written. In 1968, and we used a lot of the same ideas of that opening and uh, new burgeoning time and thought time uh, at, at the end of the, the 1960s, how everything started to really change. And yep. it's actually starting to be the same again. It's a lot of new openings happening now, spiritual openings and yep. ideology yep. openings. So it's interesting that we're putting place back at that time to revisit that thing. Yes. So we're going to reboot of that kind of really open mindedness and consciousness. And I guess that's what they're pulling upon too. They must oh, be feeling sure. the same thing. Uh, Armistead Mopin in, in Tales of the City had a line where one of his characters says, I can't find 1967 anywhere. Well, okay, we can't find 1967, but it looks like 1968 is making well, it. That's go. a big year. You, know, you can look that up and see everything that was going on from Vietnam to you know all these pro the protesting and everything starting to change and people starting to really, really take a stand for for rights of all sorts across the board. So it's a big time, and we're also doing that now. We're under an oppressive regime in the White House, and we're also now starting to rise up again as a people who aren't comfortable with that kind of regime. Or even if they are, they're still starting to see the cracks and that kind of a thing. So this is a really very timely way to put a play up, and it's specifically you know, very brave at the, during the holiday time, yep, like I think. And I so. think very smart to go see something like this during the holiday, so you have a sort of, like I said before, a cleansing of the palate, cleansing of the mind, something different than Santa Claus. Right? And I give Carrie a lot of credit. She is yet another one of those women warriors that I'm talking about that's taking control and, and running her own company. Well, it's and about damn time. Ideas. It's about damn time. <laughs> well, yeah, actually. But there are actually more is. women in the theater than there are men, statistically. And there are more women that come to see theater than yes. men, statistically. And it's very interesting that women for so many years have been kept out of the, 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 the stronger areas of the theater and just sort of kept on the side as the either bimbo or mother types on right. stage. Right. And for years and years, women weren't even allowed, by, by you know, in the past, way past, weren't even allowed to be on the stage at all without being considered prostitutes. So now we've at least come to the place where women have been allowed to be on the stage. Allowed is the word. It shouldn't be allowing that we are the ones who need to take the theater. It is our art. That's that's how I feel about it. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm all for it. On to the next. What's next? Okay. And, and last but not least, we have Connie Hoy. Connie Hoy uh, is joining the ranks of producer for Johnny B. Dunn's uh, movie for his independent film, Free Range. Now, Free Range is a very interesting plot. Free Range basically is the story of a, a group of members of a GSA. A GSA is a gay straight alliance, and that's usually a club within schools and community groups. And this group of, of uh, young people are now bucking the system, literally, and they are competing in uh, one of the largest rodeos. So uh, Connie will tell us all about that as well as what's happening with it. All right, here we go. This is Jay Michaels. Hey Jay, how are you? Nice to nice to meet you. Welcome, uh, welcome to my podcast. Welcome to the interview, uh, and welcome to Free Range. Uh, this call is being recorded for Quality Assurance. Uh, of course it is. Uh, you you're, you've just come on board as producer for Free Free Range, Johnny B. Dunn's screenplay, uh, and, and we're now in the process of of turning that into a major motion picture. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about uh, about your concept of free range. We've never met, so I'm, I'm sitting here with rapt attention as well. I gotcha. Well, um, you know, I've always loved the rodeo, and uh, just being an independent filmmaker, um, Michael Harkins, who's going to help me produce, uh, brought this to my attention. I grew up in the town of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And I worked for the world's largest outdoor rodeo. Wow. 
at uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days. So I know the appeal of what a rodeo film could mean. You know, it could be what Days of Thunder is to was to stock racing. You know, uh, to really bring rodeo up to the forefront. And you know, it's used to be the the world or the America's um, number one spectator sport. Is that more right? More so than professional football, more so than baseball. There are more pro rodeos every weekend across the United States than there than there are is NFL. Now this was back in the wow. in the early eighties when I when I was working for Frontier Days, so I know that to be a fact then. But if you think about it, rodeo kinda of runs fifty two weeks a year. Yeah. Or maybe fifty, you know. National okay. finals usually takes place right before Christmas and they start up again in January. So right. there's appeal out there and it's you know it, it puts butts in seats. I was going to say, now you say an appeal, universal appeal. Now I've, for, for me, past episodes of the Lone Ranger, I, 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 uh, I, I have never gotten on a horse. I don't know much about it. How am I going right. to enjoy this movie? Well, I think with the LGBTQ, that whole uh, aspect of this as well, um, you know, there's always a thrill of of being a cowboy, and mm-hmm. and not only with the uh, that aspect of it, as well as, you know, being down on your luck kind of guy. That's got a lot of appeal to, to me as well as a producer. So, so we have, uh, the, the, the story itself is, is two characters. One, uh, one is, as you said, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, uh, reinventing the Marlboro man on that level. It's, it's this great rodeo Absolutely. hero who is now, uh, due to an injury, uh, his life must change, and he yes. comes head on with uh, with a group of GSA uh, students, Gay Straight Alliance students, who want to be part of this rodeo. Now, now right. I I've heard there's like an untapped world to this, the uh, the that the notion of the gay rodeo is huge. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's growing every year too. Wow, it really is. So that's a whole new branch for rodeo fans um, to be, to, you know, for the, to help the attraction for the viewers to come see this film. So this is, sure. a, this is a whole untapped market. It's like we're taking something that's out there that's huge, but it's never been put on film before. Correct. That's great. Correct. That's great. I mean, there, there was a film called Eight Seconds about Lane Frost, but, you know, in that film, you know, everybody, this is, was a bull rider who died at Frontier Days. So I don't think the rodeo community really showed up for that film because we all knew what happened at the end. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't happy. So right. this actually has a really good theme. Um, you know, the aspect of the brothers and, and just incorporating GSA and, you know, the kind of down and luck old cow, you know, Barbaro man kind of guy that um, is very common in the rodeo world, man. Once you're done, you're done. And then you don't know what to do with your life. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, it was very appealing to me as well. I'm uh, uh, I, I'm going to give nothing away. There's no there's no no spoiler alert here, but uh, but right. but yes, the the whole piece is so realistic, is so is so compelling on that level. It's not formulaic. It's not uh, it, it it doesn't it, we we don't sit there and roll our eyes at any point. Uh, we really get a real sense from these characters, uh, which is which yeah. is uh, which is exactly how a film should be. Uh, in anyone I've interviewed, that's that's a main thing that they've said. They they don't want the, the, the glitz so much. They don't want the uh, the Hollywood noise. They want something real on this. Uh, and everyone I've spoken to comes out to this, and they said, wow, that's wonderful. Can't wait to support it. Um, where are we in the journey? Where the are you? In- I'm sorry? Well, that, that that's the appeal to me as well, because I came up with the likes of the Coen brothers on Raising Arizona, uh, yeah. Jim Jarmish on Mystery Train and Dead right. Man, and, and that whole indie world is – is what appeals to me the most. There's not going to be too many cooks in the kitchen. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and, uh, and ha- make it a really a true, nice little gritty independent film. You use my favorite word independent. Uh, I was just speaking to, uh, Joey McNeely, who's premiering a new musical, uh, on, uh, in, in independent theater off off Broadway. And, and he comes from Broadway world and he was saying how amazed he is at the way you can, you can almost make up your own rules in some cases. Do you find that yeah, with absolutely. independent 
filmed, you find that as much as obviously there's there's a certain technological need, you find that that your mind, your imagination is is, is the first thing to uh, to be able to utilize. Yeah, and I think you can just you know, as long as there's some sort of appeal that you truly believe um, for a viewer, you, it's really you can pick what you want to do for as a project. The, my the last film I produced was with Allison Eastwood, which was actually released just a year ago, um, called Battle Creek. And, you know, that's the fun to me of independent filmmaking is, you know, you can kind of do what you want as long as, as it, yeah, we always say, script, script, script. Of course. And uh, the story. And I believe the story's there for for Open Range. So. I've, I've seen, and do you think, do you think, uh, uh, I've kind of answered this own question by mentioning these, these movies like My Beautiful Laundrette, uh, The Full Monty. Uh, there are so many, uh, there are so many independent films that are just, uh, Slumdog Millionaire. You, you, you almost, you almost say, wow, I, who would go see that? And it turns out to be a blockbuster. Our, as much as it's not necessarily an independent film, the, the Shape of Water, last year's Academy Award winner, you would not imagine yeah. that to be an Academy Award winner. Do you think the world yeah. is, uh, we've always been we've always been open to it, but do you think the world is is clamoring for that? Do you think they would rather go see something interesting, odd from somewhere else about something else than than the customary? Have we have we entered the world of where everyone is that inquisitive in I, terms you of know, films? I, I, I can I can only speak for myself, but you know, as much of a comic book lover that that I am, I don't know how many more Superman or Spider Mans I can go see. There you go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or Robin Hood, even though I'm going to probably go see it. You know, I like the idea of telling small stories. Three billboards last year just absolutely blew me away. And and what an amazing story of a guy driving through a town and seeing these three billboards, finding out what it was about and making a movie, which, you know, garnered a lot of great performances. I think the best of last year, too, as well. Hmm. You You... You'd think uh, what you mentioned about comic books. Obviously, Stan Lee has has recently passed away, and, course, and God, when you soft. when you think about the the work he did when he came into the comic book realm, yes, every character came from another planet. It was they were infallible, and 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 they all were tremendously white, and and that was that. Uh, and he himself imbued his characters with these unique problems, these unique thoughts. My favorite Spider Man is this dweeby kid from Queens. So it's, it's, yeah, they're all flawed, weren't they? You know? Yeah, and, and yeah, Peter Parker was just a geek, but you know. So, so it really seems not, to be enticing to to find something where you could say, "What a, a a kid from Queens is now a superhuman Spider-Man?" Or, or wait a minute, I'm going to a a gay rodeo? What? Uh, it's, right. It's something where where the audience will blink and say, "No, I need to see that." Um, yeah. Yeah. What what's the next process? What's the next thing? Right now we're in screenplay. We're in we're in solicitation mode. We're we're screaming the 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 name of the of the film to the world. What's the next thing? What's what what are you working on right now? Well, I need to um see what how much we can do it for. That's that's my specialty is to to schedule mm-hmm. it and budget it and you know kind of just initially call and and figure out where we can shoot something like this so we know really what we can do. Um for what we have and um contact the PRCA and and reach out to them and and you know some maybe some sponsors and and get them on board as well too. As so well. we're we're gathering the troops essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Circle in the wagons is what I would say. Oh, uh, well put. <laughs> well put. <laughs> now here's here's the big obstacle in working in independent theater uh, which I've done for many years. I noticed that if you can't make this amount of money, okay, I could do this. I could do the play for this amount of money. I could do it for this amount of money. Instead, I'll just do a stage reading. I'll do a a workshop. You can always go, I hate to say go down, but you can always find another level to do it. Uh, you can't do that with film, or or am I wrong? You know, I, I, I think you're wrong there in a very unique way, in that um, look at what the Millers did with, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Cohen brothers did with, with Blood Simple, made, made a trailer, and, and then they went and found the money to make the film. I worked with a, um, uh, twin brothers called the, the Miller brothers, <laughs> who basically shot a trailer, went and showed it to Ed Harris, and lo and behold, we were shooting the whole film, uh, a few months later with Ed. It was called Touching Home. 
and uh, you know that got a great little release. And once again, it was a great, you know, gritty story that about baseball, America's pastime. So I, I think you know, get something that appeals. You know, get a good package together. Know that you know seasoned pros are going to be attached to this, and and confidence is high in them to really just press on and and move forward. So you say, uh, is it a common practice to create the trailer first and then solicit the film? Not necessarily, but that's certainly another approach Mm -hmm. you could do. It's funny you say about Robin Hood. I remember Kevin Costner's Robin Hood of of a million and a half years ago. uh, Yeah. And I remember there was a trailer that didn't include him, that didn't include him or Alan Rickman (laughs) or a bunch of others. I remember seeing a trailer for Robin Hood in the movie theaters that did not have them. Now, I don't know if it was another movie or something that came out simultaneous, but I remember seeing that, and then I remember seeing the movie without them. So I was like, wow. As, wow. as you said it now, I just thought, did I just see the trailer that they made in order to make the movie? So that's really no interesting. Wonder. That's really interesting. Do, do you plan to do the, with this film? Do, or are we looking at a, a free-range trailer? Um, not really. I, I have, you know, I have, I'm just in the very basic beginnings with Johnny. Uh-huh. I think it's always, you know, appealing to do some sort of sizzle reel, you know. Cool. Um, just to go along with the lookbook, you know. Right. So right. something like that. Cool. All right. So we are looking at some sort of uh, video that we'll uh, we'll see coming out, whatever it happens to be. Yeah, and with you know social media, you can really get a buzz going that way. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Between you and I, and and all my listeners, uh, I I love social media right. on that level. You can you can put one yeah. sentence out, and a million people now know all about it. I think it's it's yeah on that level, it's brilliant. Then, like any superhero, it falls into enemy hands, and that's the end of that. Um, of course. Tell us something we don't know. Tell us a secret about this movie that we don't know yet. Tell us something that won't be in the press release. Anything where you're saying, "Oh my I, gosh." I don't really have any. I don't. I know. I don't have any secrets. I'm still digging my teeth in, and. And, uh, you know, circle back to me in, in a month or so, and maybe we can give you a little tease about something. And then there'll be a story or two. Terrific. Yeah, of course. Terrific. Connie, thank you so much for letting me no and my listeners to. know about Free Range. Uh, I will, uh, on the program, I'll make sure everyone knows how to contact you or Johnny uh, in terms of interest and obviously where they can go to find out more information about it. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, Jay. Have a good day. Same to you. Ciao. Bye. Thank you, Connie, for that informative interview. Johnny B. Dunn's Free Range right now is looking for backing. It is looking for investors. If you or someone you know is interested, please contact us here at the studio, jmae.events at gmail.com. J. M A E period events at gmail dot com. Um, that's it for this program. Three interviews. Wow, we did good. Um, Mary, any final thoughts? Nope. Just let's keep women in the theater and keep the theater going. That would be wonderful. And ladies, hire me. Anyway, uh, thank you all very much. That's it for this week. Uh, really appreciate you listening again. And next week, Mary will be chatting with Susan Merson. Uh, about more uh, uh, women's issues as well as spiritual issues. And there's also a podcast coming up with David Sabella, uh, uh, the founder and editor-in-chief of Cabaret Hotspot, where Mary and I will be discussing with him the burgeoning cabaret scene. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye!